Parents should never, never tell their child that it's not okay to have a negative emotion. And you know what that leads to? That leads to avoidance strategies. Feelings are temporary. No matter how discomforting it is, it's like a wave in the ocean. It comes and goes. Why does anxiety and phobias need a separate conversation when it comes to kids than adults? Because developmentally, it looks different in children. And oftentimes children are misdiagnosed. Mm. A lot of times because children are growing, they have these very short periods of time in which they appear to be struggling with something. And that's actually developmentally normal. So we also don't want to pathologize these children needlessly. We don't want to make it look like everybody has a disorder because they're just going through some growing pains. And so I think that's why the separate conversation is needed because there is a lot more sensitivity to how long they have to be suffering with something before it really does warrant some professional intervention. So let's start with what life looks like for a child who has anxiety. Particularly as a child, you need somebody to take care of all of your business. Mm -hmm. You can't support yourself. That's the way that mammals work. Mm -hmm. And as children, their attachment develops based on whether or not they feel secure when they're with their primary caregivers, when they're in their environment. Do they feel safe? And anxiety can develop when there's a very chaotic environment when your primary caregivers aren't always consistently there to support you, especially when you fall or have a fear or have something bad happen to you. So sometimes it's environmental. And if there is structure and if there's an establishment for safety, then the child can come back from anxiety pretty easily too. Or is it more just a predisposition that they have from birth? Anxiety does show some predisposition. So we know that even from birth that there are differences in temperament. So for example, some babies are just harder to soothe. They're a little bit more sensitive to noises and lights and other types of sensory information. Usually that's a precursor for having a little bit more of an anxious temperament. Doesn't mean that you'll develop a full-fledged anxiety disorder, but just means that under pressure or under stress, you are more likely to develop some anxiety symptoms. Anxiety manifests in a type of a difficulty with going to school, mm. with pretending that they're sick so that they don't have to go to school. Oftentimes there's issues with separation. So part of their not wanting to go to school isn't necessarily that they don't like school or that they are being, for example, bullied in school, but that they don't wanna be apart from their primary caregivers. And so oftentimes for children, anxiety manifests in bodily symptoms. They'll say that they have headaches. They'll say that they have stomach aches and they can't go to school. And oftentimes they also complain of other types of things like being easily distracted. And so sometimes you can see how that could lead to misdiagnoses. Is it time to take them to the primary care doctor? Is it time to see if they have ADHD? Mm -hmm. But all of the time you have to make sure that you're considering that anxiety might really be the explanation for it. So when I was young, probably between the ages of three and eight, uh, when my, specifically my mother, when she would leave for the night and I had a babysitter, oh my gosh, you would have thought that I had been stabbed in the back. I could not <laughs> believe that my mother was gonna leave me. And then it was just something I grew out of. Mm -hmm. I didn't exactly. seek treatment. There was, no, my mom just goes, well, I'm leaving. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to eventually get over it. And I did. So. But that, I, I, I'm, for a parent, how would they know if it's something they're going to get over or something that could actually be detrimental long term? I think oftentimes for children, we look about the span of three to six months. If it doesn't go away in about that period of time, then it's time to kind of look at that a little bit more in detail and to see if there's something that needs to be done. Also, some children from a very young age do show a proclivity towards being extra conscientious. So they want things to be in their place. They want things to be organized. They're a little bit of a control freak, even as a little child. And when you see that, that also tends to correlate with anxiety symptoms as they grow. You mentioned earlier about somebody or a child exhibiting anxious traits but mm -hmm. not having the disorder. Right. What is the definition of a child under the age of 10 having anxiety disorder or whether or compared to just having an anxious traits? I think there's two very major things to look for. One is, is it clinically impairing them? on a variety of tasks in their daily life. Is it impairing them at school? Is it stopping them from being able to develop good friendships? Is it hard for them to function in the home? Is it hard for them to do self-care activities like get up, get dressed, shower, mm -hmm. put your backpack together, get on the bus? That's one area. The other area is that the individual perceives a huge amount of distress. 
So if they themselves say, I'm very upset about this, I'm upset by my own anxiety, I'm upset that my stomach hurts so much, I'm upset that I can't go to school, that's the other criteria but for I, knowing that it's a disorder. How does a four-year-old do that? And that's part of the problem. With children, they don't necessarily say, this is bothering me this much. Mm -hmm. So as a parent or a teacher or an adult that is in the child's life, it's kind of your responsibility to check in, to see how they're doing, to ask very specific questions. And I think with children especially, because they're not usually mature enough to spell it out with their own words, it's important to ask them very, very pointed questions about it. Because when you ask, you do get an answer. Yes. So for a child who goes three or six months, mm -hmm. with, and a child being, we're calling a child what? Anyone under the age of 10, 18? Yeah, and any, well, I guess, you know, if we're talking about a minor, yeah, anybody under the age of 18, I guess we've been focusing a little bit more on the younger children, so. Let's start there. Yeah, That's, let's like do that. that. Mm -hmm. So with the younger children, let's say under 10, they are getting out of school, talking about how anxious they are going to school, faking being sick so they can avoid it. It's been going on three to six months. What's happening on a neurological level? So oftentimes with children, what they notice is just that they have a difficult time handling and managing their environment. Mm -hmm. So if they feel like there's too much stimuli or that there's too much of a focus on them individually. Individuals who have anxiety sometimes don't like when other people are looking at them, paying attention to them. And so if they feel like there's too much going on in that direction, they'll oftentimes start to feel not only the bodily symptoms, but just worries, fears about what's gonna happen next. And in fact, anxiety wouldn't even exist if we didn't have the, the ability as human beings to think into the future. Yeah. Because if we're being mindful and we're just staying in the present moment, nothing's happening except that we're sitting here and having a conversation on a couch. It's when your mind races to, what do I have to still do for the rest of the day? What's gonna happen when I have to give that school presentation? When I go and play on the schoolyard, am I gonna get bullied again? It's when you think in the future that anxiety happens. And so children who sort of have that future forecasting ability and tend to attribute negative outcomes to the future are more likely to have anxiety. This is really good. I like <laughs> that. This is so good because it's anxiety only can occur because we have the ability to think about the future. Yes. Which immediately tells me a way to combat anxiety, and this is higher level, not just with kids, but for anybody, being in the moment, being mindful, being present, mm -hmm. however you get there, meditation, whatever. Right could be a way to treat, is a way to treat the anxiety. Absolutely, and I think it's interesting because most children have a hard time thinking into the future yeah. because they're so present-minded. Right. You know, the minute they don't get a toy, they're like, my world is over. Yeah, yeah. They don't think that in five minutes they won't even want that toy anymore. Right. But I think sometimes children who are a little bit more beyond their years that way, they their brains are sort of accelerated in terms of thinking into the future and projecting. Sometimes that actually leads to anxiety. And there's been a number of studies actually looking at people who are more conscientious, more ambitious, and whether or not more anxiety occurs. And we're not talking necessarily about one that's diagnosed as a disorder, but just anxiety symptoms in general. Yes. Also, anxiety can have a very physical manifestation for people. So when people say that they're having an anxiety attack, they may mean that they are having a panic attack. It means that they're having all these physiological reactions, quick and heartbeat, heart pounding, maybe sweating, maybe just feeling like you're crawling out of your skin. So that would be just some of the examples of how anxiety can manifest in the body. And uh, for a child, is it the same thing? For children, I think they don't have as many emotion words to capture how they're feeling, but they oftentimes will talk a little bit more about things hurting, so headaches and stomach aches. They sometimes will just say that they don't feel right because their vocabulary is a little bit more limited. Sometimes it's hard to know exactly what it is that's going on, but I have found that with children, oftentimes they'll talk about pains in their body. Is a temper tantrum a panic attack for a child? Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah, so I think sometimes with children who have temper tantrums, it is because they're overstimulated mm -hmm. and they need to kind of gain control of their environment again. Other children are just having temper tantrums maybe because they need to have limit setting, maybe because they have another type of issue like an externalizing behavioral problem such as ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder. So it can really vary. Are there red flags that would tell a parent, all right, stop asking questions, get this kid into a psychologist or therapist or psychiatrist ASAP? Well, there's a couple of things that we would look for. I mean, oftentimes children who are anxious, they cry. 
And so if you see that they're crying multiple times a day, sometimes being set up by things that are just really at the drop of a pin, mm -hmm. it's time to see if they need some professional intervention, mm -hmm. especially if the teachers are already pointing it out, if they're having difficulties even just maintaining eye contact. I mean, just things that feel kind of basic but mm -hmm. are important for our social functioning. Mm -hmm. That's another reason to go and consult with a professional. I think oftentimes when children are really anxious, because they can't really speak about it, there's so much agitation. So every once in a while you will see a child acting out, and this goes back to your earlier question about temper tantrums, mm -hmm. that sometimes you will see that. And if it happens all the time, especially around stressful events, like going to school, finishing a homework assignment, being around too many people at one time, that's another clue that perhaps it's actually anxiety and you need some professional support. Phobias. Phobias. We've talked about anxiety. Yes. What's a phobia? Uh, phobia is an irrational fear against something that probably doesn't have the proclivity to harm you as much as you think it does. So it's not a phobia to be afraid of a saber-toothed tiger if you're in a cage with them. Mm -hmm. That's not a phobia. That's mm -hmm. a very realistic fear and you should be afraid for your life. Mm -hmm. A phobia would be being afraid of a tiny spider that is not poisonous but you just don't like spiders. Mm -hmm. And then it makes you not even want to be in the room with them, run away, cry, mm -hmm. right? It's irrational because they're actually not going to do anything to you. So phobias are irrational fears. Yes. With children under the age of 10, what are their common phobias? Common phobias are monsters underneath the bed, mm -hmm. um, lots of monster types of phobias. They oftentimes also have phobias. Interestingly, younger children have phobias of germs. Mm. And so it almost looks like OCD. It mm. almost looks like obsessive compulsive disorder. But again, children can grow out of that. So don't be afraid if all of a sudden your child's afraid of germs and they're young, maybe in a few months, it's gonna go away. Got it. So objects, monsters, um, and I think cleanliness are three of the biggest ones. And do you see common phobias in teenagers? Common phobias in teenagers are sort of run the gamut a lot more. Mm -hmm. I think at that point they've had a little bit more life experience and they actually sometimes start to develop phobias from watching other people. If they see other people be afraid of something, like their own parents, their friends, then they all of a sudden start to be afraid of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there, I see so many parents mm -hmm. who are afraid of dogs and then their kids who oh, are right. five are afraid of dogs. Yeah. Because they just go, this is mom and dad are scared of this, so I need to be scared of this. Absolutely. And yet again, you know, you look to your caregivers uh -huh. for how you should be navigating your life and your social world. So that doesn't surprise me at all. So that, co that covers the 10 and under. Mm -hmm. I would imagine it's maybe a little easier to have these conversations, maybe, maybe. with <laughs> a child who's 10 to 18. Yes. How does anxiety manifest differently in that demographic? I think oftentimes, with the preteens and the teenagers, it manifests more sort of in like a decreased zest for life. Because they are so anxious, it actually limits their ability to go out and do new activities and meet new people and put themselves up to just the kind of new opportunities that sometimes can actually make you feel really happy and really confident about yourself. So I think with preteens and teens, you see them kind of isolating themselves. But don't like, I, I'm not a parent, but don't all preteens and teens isolate themselves? I feel like they all go home, lock themselves in the room, listen to music, like, leave me alone. Like, yeah. that's just what they do. I think mostly, that's a really good point. I think mostly it's about friendships. If they're isolating themselves from their peers, who they're supposed to want the love and support yeah. of the most at that age, yeah. that's when you know something's going on. That's important to note. Yeah. Yes. yes. Definitely. As a parent, yes. I mean, that they want to go and lock themselves in their rooms and talk to their girlfriends. That That's not really as much of an issue. But if they're locking themselves in their room, not talking to anybody, mm -hmm. and at school, they're isolating, that's a big issue. We that. oftentimes also see that their grades start to drop. Again, they lose motivation for what they used to like doing. So they stop participating in extracurricular activities and they stop working in school. And that's another thing to look for in those uh, preteen to teenage ranges. Why is it so important to watch this series? I think it's important because anxiety is such a big problem and it's a big problem that a lot of times people don't talk about or they throw it around very flippantly like, ah, I'm just anxious. Well, are you serious about that? Is it actually impairing your life? And if it is, we need to do something about it. And with children, because they don't have that developed vocabulary, it can impact their life in so many significant ways and yet they can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important as parents, as caring adults, to know the signs of anxiety and to know that it's not something else. Sometimes people think it's ADHD. Sometimes people will think that there's a medical condition. It's not, it might be anxiety. So make sure you know the signs and be able to delineate that for yourself. 
Thanks for watching. Check out the links below for more information on how to access this full series and subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new mental health videos every week. Did you like what you heard in this video? If you want to ask a MedCircle doctor a question directly, you can learn how by visiting the links in the description below. Thank you.